Hi, this is Dr. Bob Dannenhofer, the Public Health Officer from Douglas County. It's August the 25th, and we're going to do our twice-weekly Facebook update. As you know, on many of these things, I try out all these new masks that they say that are out there. And this is one called the XC99. So let me take it down here so I can show you about it. This is a clear plastic mask made of a soft material. It's not particularly uncomfortable. It does have a valve, and we generally do not like things that have an exhalation valve. See, this is not particularly a valve. This is a filter, so this one should be okay. However, the problem is these are not standardized by anybody, and it probably is okay, but you can't be sure. I'm not sure that it works all that well to read lips because it does fog up pretty well, but it's another one that's out there, and as these new ones come out, I'll give it a try. But again, Dr. Bob Dannenhofer, the Public Health Office from Douglas County. This is the time for you to ask questions. So if you have questions, please put them in our, in our um, Facebook Live. You know, we've had troubles with outsiders, maybe bots even, uh, trying to get to us. So again, if you're going to put a comment there, tell us something nice about Douglas County or something only somebody from Douglas County would know. If you're from another area, and we've had a dozen or so people from other places around the country who say, look, I'm not a bot, I'm a real person, but I found you and we like you. If it is, just write something about the area you live and, and we'll see it. So if you're from Madison County, tell us about the beautiful bridges. Okay, so we'll, as we always do, we start from the top and move down. There's some really interesting stuff today. So we're at 24 million cases in the world, 822,000 deaths. So we're continuing to add cases at a very brisk rate. However, the new cases is kind of flat, and the new deaths is kind of flat, and that's good. Still very active in the U.S., Brazil, and India, Pretty much all of South America has got a lot of cases over the last few weeks. We are also a little disturbingly seeing a resurgence of cases in France, Germany, Spain, and Israel. These are all areas that had it pretty much under control for a few months, and they've really started to roar back. That's worrisome for us because we never really did get it down, and the concern is that when the fall comes that we may see this resurgence. But right now, pretty quiet. In the U.S., we're going to hit 6 million cases tomorrow, I think, 182,000 deaths, and likely by the end of the year, we'll have 200 or 250,000 deaths. That's a lot of deaths. Still very active in California, Texas, and Florida, and today, again, more than 1,000 deaths in the U.S. Oregon is slowing. We're at 25,000 cases, 427 deaths, but the cases are slowing. The new hotspots now, Jackson County over the last two weeks has really become a hotspot. Marion County and Malheur County still hot places. Douglas County has been so quiet. So just 172 cases. We had three cases today, but we went three days without a single case. So now just three cases over the last four days. In the last two weeks, we've only had nine cases in each of the past two weeks. And so you remember to start school, one of the metrics is less than 10 cases per 100,000 per week. We have 110,000 people in that. So if we stay less than 11 cases a week, this will be our third week. And at least by that measure, we could open school. The other two measures is the county positivity rate. Our county positivity rate is less than 1%, one of the lowest in the country. Unfortunately, the, the state positivity rate is still more than 5%, although looking at some data today, there's a hope that that will come under 5%, in which case then in three weeks, we might be able to open all of the schools in Douglas County, and that would be great. A um, couple of new uh, news things that have come out. Uh, this week, they approved the use of convalescent plasma. So convalescent plasma is plasma that's drawn so the clear part of the blood that's drawn from people who recently have had the disease and have high levels of antibodies. And then this is given to people who are sick with the disease and looks to see if it made a difference in their outcome. So they've given over 70,000 doses of this throughout the country. So a lot of doses, right? So think there are only 170,000 deaths and they've given 70,000 70, 70, doses. So they've given a lot of it. It's, it appears to be really quite safe. So there don't really appear to be any safety problems. In terms of efficacy, it's hard to know. If you slice and dice the data one way or another, there might be a slight difference. Unfortunately, this is not going to be a home run that we were hoping for. In some cases, it really is. In some cases, convalescent plasma is really 
life-changing. In this disease, it appears it's not going to be. It might be a, a slight improvement. So if we've talked about um, uh, Decadron, which really does appear to be a, a, a double in the, in the alley. Uh, remdesivir, probably a bunt single. This is probably a walk. All things that you wouldn't pass up and say don't do, but it's probably not going to be the great thing we thought before. On the same theme of antibodies, Another way to do this is to get an antibody that you know is going to work and mass produce it in the laboratory and then give it to people who are at high risk. So uh, there is one of these studies. It's called a monoclonal antibody. And they're actually trying it in nursing homes. When there's one outbreak in a nursing home, they're going to give it to other people in the nursing home and see if this monoclonal antibody protects them from getting the disease. So kind of as a preventative. We talked about this back in March and April as a goal and one of the things that we could do because if you could give this to people at exposure or soon after exposure and it could prevent them from getting the disease or they just got a mild disease, that would be a great thing. So monoclonal antibodies, another thing that's hopeful. Uh, the vaccine still making good progress. There have not been any, any things standing in the way that we've seen. Apparently, both Russia and China are actually starting with the vaccine. I think in the U.S., we're going to be lots safer. Now, one of the things that we have been terribly, terribly worried about with this, was, with this whole pandemic, is that behavioral health things will get worse. And the downside of that is that we'll have more suicides. And so we're looking very, very carefully at the suicides uh, related to this. So two ways to look at suicides. One is to look at death certificates. But those, because the way we do death certificates are frequently quite delayed and hard to get statistically. The other way to do it is to look at other indicators of suicide, which is like calls to suicide prevention lines, calls to poison control, or poisoning seen in the in the hospital, because typically with poisonings there's there's ten or twenty unsuccessful poisonings with every successful one. So if you saw a huge increase in poisonings in the hospital, that might be a signal that there'll be an increase in in suicides. Thank goodness, so far at least, calls to the poison center, calls to Lines for Life, and overdoses in the emergency room have not really changed in comparison to last year. So at least for now. It does not look like we're seeing a huge wave of suicides associated with it. But we do know that people with troubles with anxiety and depression really are struggling. Okay, so let's get some of your questions. We have more stuff here later. So will there be drive-through clinic, drive through flu clinics this fall? Yes, there will be. We're working on details. We do not yet have public health um, vaccine yet, but we are planning to do multiple drive-through flu clinics this weekend. So Brenda says, so are we able to open schools? So it's complicated, but in Douglas County, we can, if the, if the numbers stay, we can open K-3, continuing technical education, and special education. And schools in these remote areas that have a small number of kids can open. So districts like Camas, uh, the Milo Academy, Days Creek, and whatever could open to all grades. If we can continue the rate less than 10, the positivity rate in Douglas County of less than 5%, which we almost certainly will, and a state positivity rate of less than 5%, we're not there yet, but I hope we'll get there soon, then we could open the schools. The second part of this question, if I had a grade school child, would you let them go in person? And the answer is, yes, if we met all the guidelines, I would. Because the data is really clear in other countries that open schools, when they had low rates of disease, that they could do it, and they could do it safely. So I think the data is there, we could do it. I, d I did some modeling from one of the school districts about if we were able to keep less than 10 cases a week in Douglas County, What's the chance that your kid would get infected in school? And be very, 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 very small, right? So there are about 15,000 students and teachers in schools. And so at one case per 100,000, there would likely in the entire county be zero or one school that would have one class affected. That's pretty good odds, right? Because um, there's all kinds of things that happen. You can never reduce the risk to zero. But one class 
in one school each week is a pretty low risk. And I think certainly if this were my kid, I would do it because the risk of not going to school is great. I mean, how do you teach a second grader to read if you need to be at work or, or and you can't be teaching them to read? How does that happen? How do, how do kids learn to sit in their seat and work with class if they're just doing this at home? And it is hard. So yes, if we followed these rules, I would certainly send my kids or grandkids to school. Okay, so why is the number of people in isolation fewer than the number of presumptive cases in the noon update, right? Because some of these presumptive cases are months old. So one of the, the our first presumptive case was uh, somebody who was the spouse of somebody who was sick. They were, they both kind of knew where they got it from. They were both equally sick. The one spouse got tested and was positive. The other spouse said, no thanks. I don't really, I saw that test. I don't really need to get done. I know what I have. And they didn't get tested. So they're forever, therefore, they will forever be a presumptive case. They're way beyond any, any uh, incubation period. So although they're a presumptive case, they are not currently infectious. And so many of the presumptive cases, especially the ones that were at Mercy, are past their symptoms, past their isolation period, so they'll forever remain presumptive. So the number of presumptive cases, the number in isolation, really don't make much sense. I think now, of all the cases that we have that are in isolation, only one is presumptive, and that's a family member of somebody who's sick, so very likely has it. Uh, all the other cases are confirmed. Okay. Um, so Clover says, will you inform folks that contact tracing is private? There's so much false information out about there about cell phones and losing freedoms. Yeah, so other places in the world do not have private contact tracing. So there are other places in the world that are tracking everybody's cell phone, tracking everybody's credit cards, and have multiple closed-circuit television sets so they can actually follow people day and night wherever they were at and... They, the way they figure out contacts is they do the algorithm that if you're both in the same cafe at the same time, you're a contact. We do not do that here. We do it the old-fashioned way. Somebody is a case, we call them up and say, hey, where were you during the time that you were likely infectious? Were you here? Were you there? Who were you with? And whatever. And for the most part, people have been incredibly, incredibly great to work with us. We've had an occasional person who doesn't want to talk to us. We've had some people who may have something embarrassing that they don't want to tell us. But for the most part, people have been great. And then they say, well, yeah, I went to lunch yesterday with Brian, and we talked for an hour or so about about the football season and, and such. And so if, if that was in my infectious period, they would then say, well, do you have his name and number? And I would have his name and number. And then they would call me and say, ooh, you know, we understand you had lunch yesterday with Bob and he was in the infectious period. So uh, you should quarantine. So that's what happens. There is no losing any freedoms here. I mean, calling my friends and who I went to lunch with is the way we do contact tracing. We do not use closed circuit TVs, chips, or anything else like that. So um, somebody says, since we have learned how to keep doctors and nurses safe, can't we do the same with teachers and kids? Absolutely. I think the school plans, and I've looked at each of the school plans for the county, I think the teachers are going to be really quite safe. Um, uh, there's going to be distancing. There's going to be use of masks. There's going to be lots of hand washing, smaller cohorts. I think all of those things are going to be great. I think that you know, looking at it, that 99% of the classrooms and 99% of the teachers will not get infected during this year. Uh, during any week in this year now, cumulatively they could be, but in any week of the year, we don't. Th we think 99% of the kids are going to be are going to be safe. So we think it's going to be a safe deal um, to keep stay safe. Social distancing. I know teachers love to hug their students. Probably avoid that. We know that kids love to glom on each other and whatever on the playground. I think I'd avoid that. And kids in the past had gone to school when they were a little sick. Uh, we certainly know that's happened. I would hope that stops. So I think if kids stay home when they're sick, teachers stay home when they're sick, we socially distance, wash our hands, wear masks, I think school's going to be okay. So Veronica says, if I had a grade school grandchild, would you babysit them after school at my age? Yes. And, and, and I would do that. That's a risk I would take. Again, the risk of getting the disease from a younger child is pretty low. Um, there's a lot of controversy about this, how much it spreads among kids, but I think the data from Europe is pretty good that in almost every case, the kids were the end of the infection chain rather than the beginning. 
So, so I think it would be safe. Yeah, so what's my knowledge about what Dr. Harvey Reich is saying about hydroxychloroquine? I spent about an hour on this last night. I don't get it. So this is a guy from Yale. He's a professor of epidemiology. And I don't know. Um, there's so much more emotion in this. You know, when you talk to epidemiology professors, it's usually the world's most boring thing. So usually they, you know, usually they're talking about the R naught and how you figure it out, whatever is like. Uh, this guy is so animated and so heartfelt about this. And the thing that's funny is that usually epidemiology professors can't say anything without quoting two or three excellent studies. And I, so I don't know what I don't know what to make of this. You know, his sense is that hydro, is that the the French study on hydroxychloroquine and the and the Henry Ford study are such great studies, and we should follow that. They're really not. So I, I don't know what's going on with that. So state water, our numbers are over 2,000, but hospitalized is under two, under 150. Are the rest not requiring medical care? And the good news is that most don't. So about 80% of the people who have the disease don't require any, certainly, inpatient care. Remember, about 40% of the disease have the disease or are asymptomatic. Another 40% are mildly symptomatic. And now you pretty much only get hospitalized if you need oxygen or fluids. And so we have a bunch of people who are actually even on home oxygen or very carefully followed at home. A number of people who've been in the hospital and get better and then get back in the hospital. So it really is complicated. But yeah, at, at under 150, that's great. Now, to, uh, you know, when I looked at uh, other places, other places have far higher hospital rates that are really taxing the system. But in Oregon, not so much. Uh, so Mari says, when does the flu season start and when is the peak typically? So in a typical year, and there's no exactly typical year for the flu, uh, typically it starts around Thanksgiving as people go visit and travel, spread the disease, then gets worse over Christmas and starts to peak in January, February, and then goes away by March or April. In several years, we've seen a biphasic peak, and I think we saw that last year, where there was an early peak with A and then a secondary peak with B. Some years, it's totally screwed up, like in the swine flu back in 2009. It was happened in the fall of the year. But if you had to pick a typical year, it would start in, in Thanksgiving to Christmas and then get worse in January, February. We're hoping there's going to be a, a quiet flu year because many of the ways that flu spreads, the same way COVID spreads, but droplets. And we're hoping that people are going to use masks, socially distance, stay at home when they're sick. And we hope there's going to be a quiet flu season. Now, the flu season uh, is very much temperature dependent. So you don't see very much flu until October or November. And then you don't see very much after April or May. And that was the original hope with COVID. It didn't work out that way. But what we have seen is that our flu season in the winter, in our winter of the year, is similar to the flu season in our summer of the year in the Southern Hemisphere, which is their winter. And they had a very mild flu season, so the hope is that for us, this will also be a very mild flu season. And that's a good thing, because flu and COVID are going to be really hard to separate without a test. Yeah, so Luann says, as an elementary school teacher, I was told that a face shield that doesn't cover my eyes doesn't comply. I get nausea and headaches with covering my eyes. That's a problem uh, because the face shields to work need to go from the forehead to underneath the chin and to the sides of the face. Now, the unfortunate part about face shields is that OSHA has developed exquisite guidance about face shields. And so you remember the ward I wore at the hard plastic thing and the yellow top and whatever. Those face shields were developed and the specifications were to prevent me from flying objects in the shop or to prevent me from sparks when I was working in an environment. They weren't to protect you from my cough and sneeze. And so the requirements that OSHA has are really to protect me against that. And so we've seen a lot of face shields out there that are very minimalist. I saw this one that just barely covers the mouth those aren't really going to work very well. So we would recommend if you're going to do a face shield. If you can't wear a mask or 
or a face shield. There's a bunch of different one kind of things to try, like this XC99 or something else to give it a try. There is going to be the occasional person who can't do either, and really very occasional. Those people probably shouldn't be in the classroom. So if someone comes in with symptoms, will be tested for flu and COVID, Brenda says. Um, so if you're talking about it comes into my office in the wintertime with that, yes, I think they probably would get tested for both. Now this year, because there were not enough COVID tests, they had people tested for flu first. And if you were positive for flu, they never tested you for COVID. We turned out that that was not particularly smart because there were a lot of people who had both. But I think this year, the hope is that we're going to have plenty of tests for COVID and we'll be able to test everybody who's symptomatic for both flu and for COVID. Now, testing you for flu is important because there are treatments for flu like Tamiflu. Testing for COVID is important to know who needs to get isolated. Okay, a couple other things. Um, Hong Kong reported that there really was somebody got reinfected. So this was a person who was sick earlier in the year with uh, COVID-like symptoms. He got tested, was positive for COVID. So very clearly infected the first time. Then went four and a half months and was well during those four and a half months. Went to Spain, came back, had a test when they got back to Hong Kong and was positive again. Now the thing that they were able to do is they were able to actually figure out the exact genome of the virus the first and the second time. And the genome of the virus the first and the second time are different, suggesting that this was not a recrudescence of his previous infection. This was a clearly a new infection. Well, the bad news on that is, well, you mean the antibodies don't protect you for more than four and a half months? That would be a bad thing. But the good thing was the second time he was totally asymptomatic. So it's possible it doesn't fully protect you meaning it doesn't fully protect you from getting reinfected. But if the second time you got this, you were asymptomatic, that would be okay. Um, so I don't know about the answer on that one. That, I think, is going to be something we're going to learn about a lot more in the next few weeks. So we had a question last week about the vaccine. And the question is, if everybody doesn't get the vaccine, and the vaccine is only 50% effective, is there any use in doing that? So... The FDA has said for a vaccine to be approved, it has to have at least a 50% efficacy. That is, if you compare the infection rate among the people who were immunized in the control group, that the infection rate in the immunized group has to be less than 50% of that in the, in the control group. That's not a great vaccine, but that's similar to what would happen with the flu vaccine. And then a recent study that came out has suggested anywhere from 40 to 55% of people would get the vaccine. So let's say that 50% of the people get the vaccine and it's 50% effective. That adds about 25% of herd immunity. That's not great, but when you add any amount of herd immunity, that decreases the spread. So we think you have to have 60 or 70% to really get rid of the disease. But herd immunity, even of 30% or 40%, is worthwhile. Unfortunately, the herd immunity in Douglas in uh, Oregon so far is only 1%. In Douglas County, it's probably less than 1%. So we're not close to getting there. So if we were able to increase our immunity from 1% to 26%, that would be something. Yeah, so is there a way to have the recommended face shield specs for those of us working with the public who don't wear uh, correct face coverings? So there was something done by OSHA today. It, you can find it on the OHA website. And it talks about coming to about the level of the ears, covering above the level of the forehead and below the level of the chin. So there are many face coverings out there that would actually meet those. The face shield specs, if you look on OSHA, though, are the ones to protect you from flying objects in the shop. Uh, those would clearly work. Those are clearly acceptable, but they're probably more than you need, right? They have to be able to block a speeding object traveling at a certain speed. Um, the face shields that you need for COVID don't need to be that strong. Uh, but if you follow those, you, they would work. But again, look at the thing on OHA. I think it was great. So Andre says, if I get tested, how long should I stay home after I get tested? So if you get tested, we would say that you should stay home the longer of uh, when your symptoms are gone plus a day. 
or when your test comes back. So if your test takes five days to come back you should, and you get well in three days, you should stay home five days. If your test comes back the next day but you're not feeling great for six days, you should stay home for seven days. So the longer of your test coming back or all of your symptoms gone plus one day. We think that once all of your symptoms are gone plus one day, you're very unlikely to be, uh, very unlikely to be infectious. Okay, so Rob says, so if most of the cases are not requiring hospital stays and the original lockdown was to flatten the curve and protect hospitals, why are we 180 days into restrictions? Well, so the original lockdown, the closure of everything, was actually to prevent the hospitals from being overwhelmed, and we did it. So there are places in the world where the hospitals were clearly overwhelmed. Italy, Spain, France, New York City, New Jersey, Florida, Texas. So there clearly were places where hospitals were clearly overwhelmed. And you only have to read some of the heart-wrenching stories to realize they were overwhelmed. Clearly, we're not overwhelmed in Douglas County. And uh, so we're, we're not overwhelmed, and that's why the lockdowns are gone. This is why we're in phase two. Right now, there aren't a lot of restrictions. Almost all businesses, almost all businesses can open without lots of restrictions. And I will tell you that when we look at the restrictions, you know, the, the decreased seating in restaurants and whatever else, the big problem when I've talked to a bunch of restaurateurs is not, boy, I could double the number of people here if I could just have more seats. Their big problem is there aren't enough people coming in, even with the lower amount of, of, of traffic. So I, I don't eat out very much, but uh, you know there are a lot of restaurants that are closed down far more than you need to. So there are a lot of fast food restaurants that have no in-person dining. That's not a restriction that's put on by the government. This is because they don't have a lot of people who want to eat there because of the lockdown. Uh, because of the disease. And so I looked at other places around the country that have much less restrictions. So I looked at Georgia, South Dakota, and Idaho that had far less restrictions. And I looked at their newspapers. They're having the same issues with restaurants we, are, we have. Restaurants are closing. Restaurants are not opening up. People are losing their jobs in restaurants. And there it's not because government says you can't open. There it's because nobody wants to go to the restaurants. And so it's not exactly clear what lockdowns you're talking about here because there's really no lockdowns in Douglas County. So, Rob, if you want to tell us what, what lockdowns you're talking about that you would change, let us know. So uh, Michelle asks, are there false positives as well as false negatives? And the answer is yes. So a false positive test is you really don't have the disease, but it comes back positive. And then false negatives are you really have the disease, but the test comes back as negative. False positives are much less common than false negatives. So false positives say you have the disease when you really don't. We think on the PCR tests that look for the three things. So these are the ones that do with the deep nasal swab. And these are the ones that are done by Quest or done by LabCorp, done by the state lab. We think the number of false positives there are almost zero. In fact, we are uh, a number of big places up in Portland have looked at ones that they say, wait a minute, this person has no symptoms. I wonder, and we test them again, and they're positive again. So they're not sure that there are any false positives using those high-quality tests. Now, if you use an antigen test, which is this test that looks for the protein, or you use the uh, Abbott ID now, there probably are some false positives. So on the Abbott ID now, it's probably one in 500 positive test results is a false positive. Still pretty low, um, but there are probably some on the antigen test, there are probably some false positives. So people who follow the news remember a story about two weeks ago, the governor of, of Ohio was going to visit the president and had one of these antigen tests on the nose that was positive. He was subsequently tested several times with other tests and they were negative. That may have been a false positive, although we're not going to know for sure. But that test isn't, isn't marketed as, as a test in asymptomatic people. So you're not supposed to do this in asymptomatic people. And why they did this in them, I don't know. And so it was a test used inappropriately that got a perhaps false positive result. So false positives do occur, but they're pretty uncommon. False negatives occur all the time. So false negatives can occur because the test may not find the DNA. Now, if the DNA, if the RNA is there and you know the RNA is there, they're pretty sensitive, maybe 95% sensitive. But 
when you're actually doing the test in a person, you may not get any stuff when you pull the swab out. You may not. You may be testing them a little too early in the course of the disease or too late in the course of the disease. So in the real world, we think there's probably a 30% false negative rate on these tests. And so that's how it is. Oh. So Shelby said, I heard Sweden is close to herd immunity. Absolutely, positively not. You know, the latest studies suggest that they're at 70%. Uh, they're about, they're in the teens in terms of their immunity. That is not close to herd immunity. So they're not. Where'd you hear this? Because that clearly is not right. Um, yeah, so Stephanie said those face shields that sit on your chin and go up to your nose, are they okay for kids to school, go to school again? We don't think that those going to be appropriate because they, you know, they, if you think of what they're supposed to do, is supposed to protect the spray. So if I'm wearing a face shield that goes to here and here, the spray is mostly going to get caught. If you look at these little things that sit kind of on the chin and then slide down or whatever, they're probably not going to work. But again, OSHA has not even... OSHA has not even looked at them yet. So do you think there will be a mask in the near future that will protect the wearer for public use? Well, you know, there's, it seems bizarre to me that we don't, have N90, we don't have an N95 mask for anybody who wants one. I mean, N95 masks, so here's the one I was wearing today. I mean, these are little pieces of paper and cloth and whatever else. You know, that early on, I could see where you wouldn't have enough of them, but God, we're six months into this, guys. This, this... This is not all that high tech. We should be able to have N95 masks for anybody who wants them. I don't know when we're getting them because there's still a shortage. You know, I looked, tried to look today to see if I could buy some N95 masks. You can't. Yeah, so Ralph says, would it be reasonable to expect a person who received the vaccine and then got COVID to have a less severe case of the disease? And, and that may well be the case. Uh, we do know with flu vaccine that if the flu doesn't, if the flu vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting disease, uh, there's a lower rate of hospitalization and death, and people got the vaccine. So it may well give you a milder case of the disease. Similarly, like the past infections, may give you a milder case of the disease in the future. In which case, having some herd immunity may may help you the next time. But again, we don't, except for the slums of Mumbai. We don't think there's any place that has herd immunity to a level that would prevent this disease from moving through again. Because I mean, if you look at France, I mean, they have a relatively high number of cases in the first in the first wave. Germany had a fairly high number of cases in the first wave, and they're getting cases again. Yeah. So Robin says, "What is the other illnesses going around that has COVID-like symptoms?" I don't know. Um, you know, we're asking people to do tests to figure it out, but there are a lot of people who have what you think are COVID-like symptoms and they test negative. But this is not surprising. This happened back in March and April when there was a lot of other disease going around, right? There were a lot of people who'd come into the clinic and you'd say, oh, you know, you've got fever and cough. I think you could have COVID and they tested negative. We don't know specifically what they had um, because many of the viruses are hard impossible to culture, don't have anything specific about them. We generally in the past have just kind of let them go because they have a, almost a zero mortality rate. It's only because COVID has a 1% infection fatality rate that we worry about. If there was any other cold thing that had a 1% infection fatality rate, we would similarly worry a lot. I mean, we worry a, lot, we worry a lot about measles because measles is a bad disease, but it's only got a one in a thousand infection fatality rate. So it, it's this this disease having an infection fatality rate of one percent is pretty high, and that inf infection fatality rate comes from the New York data, which is probably the most the, the best data. They they did antibody studies on one point five million people. And so they really have a lot of data there. And they found that in place, some places in New York, they were 30% immunity. Other places, they were down around 10%. Uh, and looking at that, you had a very good view of how many cases there were. And they had about, uh, about 230,000 cases by antibody studies, about 23,000 cases that they found by um, um, about 23,000 cases that they found, and then about a 1% inf uh, infection fatality rate. 
So again, if people can tell us where they heard that sweetness close to herd immunity, they are not. They're not. That, they're not even not even close. Now there is some suggestion that there are some people who have T cell immunity. So that is the people who have some immunity, maybe from past other coronaviruses, will get infected, but they'll have a very mild course. We still don't know the data on that yet. But this 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 disease is pretty nasty. So we see today a case from from a, a wedding in Maine. So in the wedding in Maine, there were people in the, it was an indoor wedding, and, the, and there was one person who was infected, a bunch of other people got infected. Then there were secondary cases, then there were cases from the secondary case, called tertiary cases, and a death in there. So these are all things that do lead to disease down the way. And we know in Douglas County that you can really pretty much eliminate it. We're down to less than 10 cases a week. We really can keep this down to a dull roar, in which case we could open up other things, in which case people will feel more comfortable going to school. They will feel more comfortable um, going to restaurants, and that's what we hope for. Okay. So one of the other things I want to talk about is an increase in cases and resurgence of cases in France, Germany, and Israel. So France, Germany, and Israel really had this pretty much under control, and as they opened up, they saw a resurgence of cases. The concern there is that in France and Germany, they already had a lot of cases. So this idea that, oh, this herd immunity, you won't need to worry about it, doesn't seem, doesn't seem to be the case. And again, people talk about Sweden. Again, Sweden, about 10 million people, but two and a half times what we had in, in Douglas County in population two and a half times, and lots more deaths. I mean, 5,000 deaths uh, in there. We've only had, you know, 400 in Douglas County, uh, 400 in the state of Oregon. So would we really be okay with a 10 times higher death rate? I don't think so. Norway and Finland, both sides of Sweden, uh, took a more stringent approach, and they've had far fewer deaths. So again, there's a trade-off of deaths and restrictions. So more restrictions... Fewer deaths, fewer cases. Fewer restrictions, more cases, more deaths. And there's going to be a YouTube video that's going to be up in the next few days that goes through an analysis in the United States of four different states that took four different tracks to doing this. And there is a balance of costs from lockdown and costs from deaths. My sense is, oh my goodness, I would definitely, knowing now what I know now, choose the one strategy Um, because when you look at the economic costs, there are a lot of economic costs on every one of these areas. So when we look at Georgia, for example, that has had almost no restrictions, the the newspapers in Georgia talk about all of these restaurants that are closing, all the businesses that are closing in those areas. And it's not because of restrictions. They're closing because there's a lot of deaths. You know, the hospitals, uh, uh, the big story of the newspaper, we're down to 44 cases in the hospital. Oh my goodness, Mercy's never had more than a few. So, uh, so th- there is a, there's a balance here, and I don't know what the right balance is. Certainly, if I were making the choice, I would choose fewer deaths, fewer cases, fewer medical costs. But again, people get to choose, and the people we elect have to make that difficult choice of where you set the balance. So, if you think you'd set the balance differently, let us know. That's in the uh, uh, governor for day. We still have a couple of other challenges out there. One of the challenges is the story of people getting positive results even though they've never been tested. That's still circulating on the Internet. I still have that crisp $50 bill uh, waiting to give to the first person who can show me any evidence of that. And we still have open hour, ask the governor. Uh, so if you're the go- or be the governor for a day. So if you're the governor for a day, tell us what you would do. Would you impose travel restrictions? Would you get rid of all mask requirements? Would you open all schools tomorrow? Would you inf- would you tell the Pac-12 to open or close? These are the kind of things that I want to hear about because um, I know people people will frequently say we should stop doing something, but you have to do something. So if you're the governor, you can't just say stop doing something. You'd have to choose something you'd want to do. See, we have one more question, then we'll give it we'll give it the night. It's another beautiful night in Douglas County. So again, if somebody can tell me where they heard that um, Sweden is close to herd immunity, or what or Rob, which restrictions we get rid of. Yeah, so I saw that Sweden is doing well. Yeah, I saw that too. So Sweden 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 is doing well. If you think uh, ten times as many deaths as Norway and Finland is doing well. If you think 
in Douglas County, us having thousands of deaths rather than just a few hundred would be doing well, then, then do that. Yes, their case count is coming down as it is in Norway and Finland too. And the number of deaths is coming down as it is in Norway and Finland. But they put up with 5,000 deaths. A lot of deaths. I mean, every one of those deaths is, is somebody's grandmother or somebody's sister or, or whatever that's dying. For every one of those deaths, there's five or ten hospitalizations. Those hospitalizations are harrowing. So look that up and see, and look at the YouTube, vi YouTube video that's going to be up again. What's happening in Washington? Hurt is bad again, and it is bad again. There are three factors, we think, in Washington that are causing it to be bad again. One of the factors is the, is the Yakima Valley. So the Yakima Valley, which a lot of uh, food production in the Yakima Valley, has just never really gotten this under control. And because it was food production, they didn't really shut it down. And so there's just ongoing high levels of, of disease in Yakima Valley, which actually comes and affects Oregon in Umatilla and Morrow County and in Idaho, which also affects Malheur County. So when we look at the big outbreaks in Oregon, they do seem to be bleeding across the border. So that's number one. The second thing that's happened in Washington is that uh, there's been outbreaks on the campuses. And so Washington State and University of Washington have a, both had a number of, of of big outbreaks. And the third is they've just had so many cases that they've just never been able to to run this to ground. And and that's where we have been so blessed in Douglas County to have so few cases that when there is a case, we get on it, we get on it the first day, we can talk to people, we can go out and get them all the stuff they need, bring them a thermometer, bring them a pulse ox, talk with them every day and really really meet their needs so that they can stay in quarantine and not affect others. Other counties we know are not doing this. So we had one in another county today, which five days later, they still didn't even talk to the person. And so we've been able to bring it down. Washington has just, had, has just never had a quiet time and just never been able to bring this down. And they're stuck with this high level of cases around. And I think they're going to be stuck with this high level of cases until something happens, they may achieve, achieve herd immunity in six months or a year. That's a long time to go. Um, we may get the vaccine. We may get something else that works. But, yeah, I worry about Washington. And I worry about California. Central Valley in California, again, with a lot of food development places, hard to do. Okay, so Debbie says... Anytime you're outdoors with strangers, should you wear a mask or only if you cannot socially distance? Only if you cannot socially distance. So if you're, if you're at, outside and you're more than six feet apart, sitting still, you really don't need a mask. I mean, the chance that you could actually infect somebody outside from six feet away is pretty, pretty minimal. This is outdoors, so outdoors with strangers. And then inside is very different, right? Because inside is very different. So inside, there's much less air circulation, a thousand times less air circulation inside than there is outside. And so inside, if you cannot socially distance, you should wear um, a mask. Now, if you're seated, as I am now, in a room where there's reasonable air circulation and we can socially distance, and I, you can't see them online, but we're socially distanced, then I can take my mask down, which is why when the governor speaks, she can take her mask down, or why when the president speaks, he could take his mask down. However, on getting there, you should have your mask, or at a time when you can't socially distance, you should wear a mask. So indoors, you should always wear a mask unless you can be seated and socially distance. Outdoors, you should wear a mask again when you can't socially distance. So when I go on my bike rides, I wear a, have a mask with me, but for the most part, I'm far away from people. I don't need to wear it. But if I'm stopping at a stoplight and there are people there, or if I'm going through a crowded area, I pull my mask up. Okay. Well, that looks like it for the night. Uh, we're going to do this again on Friday. Again, uh, if you have some something, you want to earn that 50 bucks. Uh, if you have any any um, any data about getting a, a letter from public health saying that you're positive when you weren't, the second is really truly I want to hear from people about if they were governor or what they would do. So I'm on this medical advisory panel, and she asked us. She said, "Okay, if you were the governor, what would you do?" And I can tell you, there were a bunch of us last week who gave some suggestions, and it's tough, right? So if you say, "Well, just." Do travel. So what kind of travel? 
like travel within Oregon, travel from Washington. You can have troopers on the highway stopping people with Washington plates. If they say, oh, I'm just driving through, do you tag their car to sure? It's not an easy way to do this. And so travel was a tough thing. But if you have a great idea of what we should do or what we should not do, then let us know. So, for example, you might say, get rid of any of the face mask things. But we know if you did that, you'd see an increase in the number of cases. And the question, would you be okay with that? And what level would you be okay with? So those are the two challenges we have out there. Again, this is the um, XC99. Not sure about this. Uh, but um, I'll, I'll give it a try for a few days to see how it works. And again, we'll do this again on Friday. Also look at on YouTube Live for our, uh, what we call it, our doppelganger analysis. That is when we look at our doppelganger counties, how they come out. Again, Dr. Bob Danhopper, Public Health Officer in Douglas County. Thanks.